You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. Broadcasting from the Blanchestan Center, this is Phoenix FM. This is 92.5 Phoenix FM, community radio for Dublin 15. Hey everybody, it's JB Jeremy Borash and you are listening to Daryl O'Connor on the... Welcome to the Wrestling Rewind. The only wrestling podcast by fans who don't hate wrestling. So, you know, obviously Halloween is Monday, isn't it Monday? Uh, twenty eighth. It is Monday. It is. Monday. Yeah, yeah, Monday. So we, we'll we'll drop this so you guys can have it. Um, you know, while you're trick or treating or watching horror movies or whatever the kids do nowadays, because I don't know. Um, I'm actually going to watch some horror movies tonight because I missed a rake when I was away. There's like a new like Ex- Exorcist movie. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna check. well, not not that it- stuff, that franchise, but there is a movie about exorcism. Oh right, right. Yeah, because I was going to ask: Is the exercise one of those series that has like, like this amazing, iconic, original, and then all the sequels are terrible? Hold on, have you never seen the Exorcist sequels? No. Okay, we're going to we're going to take a quick, quick aside. Right, real quick. So Exorcist one, obviously great. Exorcist two, terrible. The third one's my favorite one. It actually is the best one because it's a it's, of of all of them. Of all of them, yeah, it's fantastic. Oh. Um, and I, if you guys haven't seen it, like generally watch that one. It is really good uh and then they did the, um the i guess is the beginning and the meaning which the same movie but made by different people uh they're good too but the actual series a couple of years ago there was a series released and it ends on a cliff, cliffhanger so fair warning but it's fantastic but there were two seasons made 
and it's that that's how it ended. So uh. like hopefully they will make a third season eventually, but that is good watching up until it ends and you're like Mother oh. effers, what are you doing? See, I'd always thought The Exorcist was like uh, Starship Troopers, and that mm. the original is just this sensational piece of filmmaking, um, and then the sequels are no. But the, dribble. the third one is fantastic. The third one's actually better because it's 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 based on a hospital, right? And uh, it's like a murder mystery, murder she wrote thing, and there isn't really an Exorcist in it until the end. But it's it's completely different. I it's one of the best it's one of the best horror movies of all time, actually. One of the best movies, period, is the third one. So I would say if you guys are gonna watch any horror movie uh that involves exorcism, and watch that. The one that I'm talking about at the moment now though is called Pray for the Devil. And that might be terrible, but it doesn't matter. Oh, I think so. I saw it. Yeah, I think I saw it advertised. So I'm gonna watch that and uh I'll let you know next week. <laughs> but it's Very like good. well uh, on here, but I'll I'll obviously put in our in our group chat. But Martin, we're not gonna talk about movies, we're gonna talk about wrestling because that's what we're here for. But we're staying spooky. We are staying spooky. So one of the things that we talked about we wanted to do, we didn't want to miss the miss the boat on it, is with, with the return of Bray Wyatt and bringing the spooky back to wrestling. Um, we're going to talk about our favorites, worst, best, um, interesting, unique um, wrestling gimmicks. So, man, um, how did this come about? Uh, well, again, like Dara, we like to do sort of themed stuff. I know last Halloween we did our favorite uh, horror movies involving wrestlers. I can't believe we've been at this, or I've been part of this, God, well over a year at this stage. Uh, at Christmas we did something similar. So we're just trying to think of something different to do. And uh, like you mentioned, with Bray Wyatt being the the sort of the big news at the moment, outside of however my beloved AEW has fallen apart this week, um, yeah, we just thought we'd do a kind of a a spooky spooky uh, episode. But in terms of kind of spooky wrestlers, like, what's your take on on that in general? Like, do you like? Your spooky characters, your supernatural characters, your gothy characters—is—is is that a an aesthetic you think works well with wrestling? I mean, it depends. Like in Japan, and I know uh, I'm not the expert talking talk about this. James Chupenny obviously is, so do check out his shows on it. They kind of do it the right way, where you, they have their cake and eat it too. Where they bring, and the same with uh, Mexico actually as well. Um, they have very high work rate wrestlers, and I hate to use a term, but it's the only term that works. And then they will have these classic matches as well. And, it, you know, it, it adds a bit of flavor because wrestling's all about characters and it's and stories and stuff like that. And if you if you cut that off completely, you kind of do lose a lot. Um, and then the WWE as well, like we've had so many wrestlers that show up and are supported purely, purely by their gimmick. And once it gets in the ring, it kind of collapses. The actually there was held together by this kind of thing. Um, yeah. like very much so it really was and Bray Wyatt again like look he's one of my favourite wrestlers of all time but he's a terrible wrestler <laughs> better wrestler <laughs> than me obviously but I mean like as far as like he's not a work rate guy which is why when he was released we're like there's no way he can go to AEW you know Impact would can't afford him can't afford that production value I think wrestling and this, this horror aspect if done right has a great purpose has a great surface area to work with when it doesn't work we're talk about that too but again probably one of the best characters of all time was the undertaker who again yeah. that was his thing uh matt hardy with his you know interdimensional stuff it opens up it because this isn't a sport fundamentally by allowing your by removing it off the table you remove a lot it's like again it's like a band right if you're going to see a bunch of lads play a metal band would you rather see a show or would you rather see four geeks in jeans and t-shirts? Yeah, yeah. And it's, that's it's kind of, of, you know? Uh, yeah, it's kind of similar. Um, funny that you mentioned that. Like, my uh, one of my favorite bands, uh, at least when I was younger, uh, would have been Slipknot. And I remember yeah. just the crushing sense of disappointment when uh, there was a documentary came out about them. And mm. I saw the documentary. And, you know, Joey Jorison is backstage talking about you know his his goodies and Corey Graves is sitting or no Corey uh what do you call him? Taylor. 
Taylor, Corey Taylor's sitting in the corner, like writing poetry, talking about his sad he is. And I'm like, what? No, just be monsters. I, I don't care about who you are in real life. Just be the the character. You know, so well, you know, I, I see what you're saying there. No, I get that. But like, I can, I can, you know, be like, right, where there are people too. Like Behemoth are the case in point on that. You know, you go see them and it's unbelievable. Like, and then you look at, and then they're on uh, Instagram and he's taking the, taking the piss out of everyone, you know? And you're like, not at the show, but just in general. And you're like, okay, fair enough. But I mean, I think but once, that, once, once the bell rings or even once the show starts. That, having... That's an interesting one though. Like imagine the Undertaker debuts in the era of social media. Mm. Like you couldn't have the Undertaker tweeting. <laughs> Well, look, the the thing about it is, you know, you have to draw that line where it's like, you know, with with a band, you know, it's a show. And once I said it was a show, with wrestling, people think it's real, which is still bizarre and or treat it like it's real. It's it's not just like Tony Stark isn't real. (laughs) I know Robert Downey Jr. basically is Tony Stark, but, you know, it's kind of drawing that line where you're like, no, they're people, too. And they have their own lives. And what I wrestling still hasn't I guess to your point wrestling still hasn't figured that balance out yet where it's like we need to draw this harsh line where it's like what they do on TV is not who they are but it's been written for them or else it's a character Um, so I I think for me when it comes to like uh, spookiness and wrestling or you know horror elements or whatever I, I really like it I like dark brooding sort of troubled characters I like guys who play you know like psychological warfare with their opponents and that i'm up for all the aesthetics and all the like the popping up out of nowhere and the 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 only thing that i don't like is it crosses a lane for me when it comes into okay now they're actually magic Mm. you know now it's they're not psyching out their opponent they're not just a creepy or weird person they're they haven't just you know like set up a stunt to unnerve their opponent no this is literally a magic person now um and i think part of the reason why why that's so bad um not just because it's just silly and it it sort of makes you aware of the inherent silliness of what you're watching it's because they don't then back it up in the ring so you'll have like bray wyatt like a great example a guy who was set on fire burned alive, came back from, I don't know, hell or death or whatever, uh, like this disfigured thing, right? Okay, mm. fine, fine, mm. fine. I'm on board. Bang. Gets knocked out with Nor KO on three counts. What? You know, yeah. So, but see, that's not that's not the gimmick itself. That's horrendous writing. Yeah. Well, well yeah. like, uh, but that's, it all comes down to the, the presentation to what you're presented with and, and that's what we were presented with. and a lot of the time you make a character spooky or supernatural and i mean they just they can't live up to the to the sort of rhetoric you know what they're saying in their promos mm. um and yeah it doesn't take very long then for for that whole gimmick to fall apart and that's and that's what happened that that's fundamentally what you know the damage that happened with the with the fiend you know the fiend should have been should have been one of the greatest characters of all time, you oh, know, and yeah. and, it, and still <laughs> is. I mean, Bray Wyatt's back now, and you know, it, it's still you know. But the Fiend should have. Uh, should have been it for a start. He shouldn't have went anywhere near a title for the first no. year or two. No, I mean, like t- t- I know, I know some people say, but the Undertaker did in his first year. Yeah, but that the title didn't matter. <laughs> that's, no, that's the thing. It's... when he won it, like again, guys, go back watch Undertaker's first run. It didn't matter. Like it was, I think it was uh, a conspiracy with the the million dollar man is how he won it or something. It wasn't even on yeah. his own merit. Wasn't there a, a a tombstone onto a chair as well? With yeah, Hogan, even yeah. though Hogan's head was about eighteen inches away from the chair. Yeah. But I mean, the thing like putting the belt on the fiend, like to rebook him. What I would have done is he should have had his own title if he wanted to give him a title, his own title. That he just says, I I can have this. I don't need anything else. This is my own belt. If you even... really want one. But he, doesn't, he never needed it. 
like at no point did I think the belt made him more legitimate. Did I think that it helped him in any way? All I did think, was damage. Think back him. to your think back to your like top ten memories of the Undertaker or your top ten images of the like none of them are him with the belt. No. He now, doesn't even look right with a belt. He, not, does, he never needed it. He never needed it. And it's because it's a belt fundamentally is about competition. Mm. And if you're a spooky wrestler, the last thing you're doing is going in and like you might have the five star match. Fair enough, but it doesn't matter. It's you're far, you're well above it. You're, uh, for example, when Undertaker was doing the, I'm let when Undertaker was doing the um, the Ministry of Darkness thing, he had no good matches during the ministry because <laughs> he was injured, right? He had no good matches. He was injured, um, but that didn't matter. I mean, when he won the belt and he won the belt three times, two or three times during that run, I think, because he he did the big one with Austin, um, yeah. and. You know, but that was about signing the bl- sign contracts and blood and so that it was awesome. But when they started putting belts on the Undertaker, you know, like the tag team belt with Big Show, that did a lot of damage to him as well because it's like, oh, he's competing for these titles. <laughs> it he doesn't need to do it, and I, I think if nothing else, spoopy wrestlers that use a supernatural gimmick, it should either be they don't need belts. They're well above them, or they exist in this other realm where they're just there, you know. And so we're gonna go through some of the, the main ones, um, and we'll kind of you'll see that kind of. I want you guys to like have that in mind as we're going through these, because the worst examples of it are when they try and put the belts on them, yeah. or when they use them as normal guys. Like for example, like okay, we'll start off with one of the worst ones. One of the worst ones was the the ECW zombie. Right? <laughs> Right. So if anyone doesn't know, ECW was on sci-fi when it was brought back. They wanted to have apparently they want to have a ghost or something. Uh, an alien. An alien, that was it. Thank so you. Sci-fi was was uh because their sci-fi channel, they were like, Oh, we need to get something on this that ties in with us. And they couldn't, they were like, No, no, we can't have an alien on our extreme wrestling show. That's ridiculous. Um, we'll settle for a zombie. Sure, like yeah, uh, but I didn't. I didn't know. So he actually, the, the ECW zombie, did more than I thought. They just did that intro. So they actually had wrestling matches on a on a run. Did it? You know, but like holy hell! But I, I can't. On the flip side of that, they did kind of do this li- better um, with um, Kevin Thorne. You know. Kevin yeah. Horn obviously um, was a vampire. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, and I, you know, the way they had him presented with Ariel, uh, where she was like a tarot card reader, that was fantastic. And then they dropped the ball with him. Uh, by are doing... you just saying that because she used to wear arguably the shortest skirts in all of wrestling? I'm not going to deny that's a factor. <laughs> But what I will say is I think vampire gimmicks in wrestling have always been quite good. Uh, like the most obvious one is Gangrel <laughs> and the Brood. <laughs> and that's still great because, you know, we're, we're watching, we're kind of dipping back into WWE stuff now. And, um, you know, we were watching Heat last week and I had Gangrel on it and you know, I had the Brood on it. And it, it, it elevated what Christian was doing, you know, into something a little bit more. A little bit more than just a jobber match, which is what it was. Yeah. Uh, and Gangrel is probably one of the best examples of a gimmick that sh- should not work. Do you know? Do you know what though? It's like everything else in wrestling. Uh, if you half-ass it, it'll fail. So even when <laughs> even when we're doing training, they're telling you, "Don't put your hands down. Don't try and stop yourself in midair. Yeah. Throw your full body into it." Because yeah. if you half-ass it, you'll end up hurting yourself. Well, here's an example, right? And it's the same with, with gimmicks. Like It's the same, dude. Gangrel dude. went, you can call it a silly gimmick, but he went all out with it, and we're still talking about him today. Dude, it's the same with anything, right? In Taekwondo, they're like, train like you fight, because, as you said, like you said, if, if, you, if you fight weak, sorry, if you train weak, you fight weak, right? But even in metal bands again, right? Um, when we were doing the we doing the course paint, we're doing the 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 whole full show kind of thing where you're going, you're leaving all the ring. I saw a band three weeks ago. Not going to name the band. 
And one guy had fully committed to his gimmick where he is wearing the eyeliner and doing the 80s rock and roll thing. And everyone else was just in a T-shirt. And it yes. looked terrible. He just looked like a pillock. He, he, he just looked <laughs> terrible. And I mean, that's the thing. You have to commit to a fully. If you don't commit to a fully, it just doesn't work. Kevin Thorne committed to it. It was fantastic. He had the whole thing. I genuinely do think that. Actually, Kevin Thorne is my first interview ever in wrestling. To be honest, I can't. I'll have it somewhere. I'll try to get out. Um, and when he he committed to a fully, and apparently they wanted to have a gimmick with Gang Girl, but just didn't work out at the time. That would have been cool, like a new brood. Um, yeah. I know that was the new brood, but that's probably what they should have done. And then when Gang Girl was there, you totally bought that he thought he was a vampire. Oh the funny... yeah, dude came out with the goblet and the blood and. Oh man, just the and, whole and... thing. Also, like, kind of like we kind of remembered, because um, maybe we didn't realize it at the time when we were watching it growing up. Do you remember we watched Heat last week and we were like, God, I kind of forgot like, just how weird, just like a gay, the blue meanie is. He's just a weird gay. Yeah. Gang G- Grell is the same. Gang Grell's a friggin' weird gay. You know yeah, I mean, like, I'm watching his debut here, and I, it doesn't say when it was, but um, I mean, like, it was on Heat, so. <laughs> It's kind of funny, but here's the thing, he's a guy who started on Heat, right, made his way all the way through up to, like, the upper echelon and became one of the most famous gimmicks of the Attitude Era. Never won a title, like, never won, like, a world title. I think he won a European title. I think that, I think, yeah. that, I think that's the only belt he won. I'm going to, like, double check myself. But I, he never, you know, was involved in the upper, the upper echelon of WWE or whatever. Um... And I'm just going to check now. Yeah, so he won the... Yeah, he did win the... Let's see. The, oh, no, I don't even think he did. I don't even think he did win the, the WWE. No, he never won a belt. That's oh. weird. Well, yeah. it's like you see, he never, never needed it. Like, the brood, the image of well, the brood never, coming up yeah. through the stage with the, you know, the smoke and the that, oh, that amazing, creepy music and that weird walk down like none of that's helped by them carrying you know yeah no, pounds no. Of okay gold. so he actually he did challenge for the european championship <laughs> but that was it was yeah. it he never yeah. he never won a title in wwe that's incredible it'd, not even a hardcore title everybody won make, a hardcore title and it makes sense that he'd want the european belt like that's where that's where most vampires come from, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the vampire myth starts in Europe. And... But what's in, actually what's interesting about Gangrel is, so um, WDB believed in this gimmick so much that they actually paid a licensing fee for um, for the name Gangrel so, because there is a, a, a RPG game called Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, Bloodline and Bloodlines is the video game, by the way, one of the best games of all time. You could talk about that for years. Um, it is a fantastic game. If you guys haven't played it, get on GOG, you'll love it. Um, but it's owned by White Wolf, and White Wolf are the game are the, the company that made Vampire the Masquerade. And Gangrel is a bloodline, it's a, it's a type of vampire, and that's why for years, man. Oh, that's kind of cool. That's like that's like the way they called uh Yokozuna, like Yokozuna is a. a type of sumo wrestler he's like the uh, top uh, top but, level of sumo wrestler isn't but it? It, but it gets more interesting so i don't know if you noticed this because i i noticed this for the first time playing wwe ad shoot when i was a kid and said gangrel is the property of white wolf entertainment mm. would always pop up but that also popped up on all wwe shows as well wherever gangrel was on it would be in the credits the tm yeah yeah and that's why <laughs> because so wwe believed in this gimmick so much that they paid someone which Says a lot. Um, but I mean, like, Gangrel had, like, her, you know. <laughs> Given that they won't even pay their own, their exactly. own staff after well, well, not even that, but I mean, like, you know, they won't pay for certain licensed music. Any licensed music. You know? Yeah, but, but now, but with Gangrel. Unless Triple H fancies another Motorhead <laughs> theme. But yeah, but, like, even, even, um, even to figure out, it's just, it's just wild, you know? It, it's just. It's just crazy. So um, the the inverse then of that. So you're talking about like these really cool vampire gimmicks mm. that you're looking back on, and they're really good. The the sort of inverse or the converse of that is when we were doing our run of WCW shows. Yeah. Um. It slowly, week by week, dawned on me because I always thought I really loved this wrestler. I always had really good memories of this wrestler. Mm. And as we watched those shows week by week, it dawned on me. 
that Vampiro is not very good. No, Vamp- <laughs> Vampiro, <laughs> Vampiro was. Yeah, he is the inverse of that. It, you it know. really hit me when it, we saw the, um, and I have I have this down as one the of hum- my sort the, the of human least... torch match. Was it? Oh, the human torch. Do you know what the human torch match was? So bloody ridiculous. I kind of give it a pass. Right. Um, but I have down as one of my worst spooky moments. Go the, on. Uh, do you remember the Vampiro graveyard match? Oh my god! With the with the plastic. Uh... With the plastic <laughs> headstones <laughs> and the two fellas just. It was a whole lot of punch, yeah. walk twenty steps. Punch, oh my punch. god! And then the, the tipping into the grave, and then the woman appearing at the river. Ah, the whole thing was dreadful. And that was the tipping point where I said to myself, "I don't think my childhood memories are accurate." To that, to add to that, the yeti, the yeti, <laughs> yet- where he would make his entrance through a block of ice. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, like, and I don't know if you're how you're a wrestling fan, how you couldn't know this, but the Yeti, spelt Yeti. You have to say em- Yeti. <laughs> you can't say it any <laughs> other way. Would emerge through a block of ice, yep. you know, like a Yeti, fair like enough. Yeti. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he was, in fact, a mummy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Head to toe covered in Remember, like, bandages. A <laughs> Yeti. Is supposed to be the abominable snowman, a big ape that lives in lives in uh, lives in uh, what's it Everest? Actually, they have a handprint of of a yeti in the natural uh, natural history yeah. museum in London. Shivery, so it is a real thing. Shivery big, shivery big foot. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, now here's one from TNA because we we have to give TNA some love. Oh yeah, Black Rain. Oh, and but well, do you know what? This actually is good because it ties into a couple of ones. Because poor Dustin Rhodes, for my money, one of the best wrestlers ever. You know, in terms of the entirety of his career and all that he achieved and all that he overcame. Mm. My God! Not only did he get saddled with Black Rain, he got saddled with Seven. Seven, yeah, that was in WCW. Yeah, that, yeah. You think he would have learned though? It's like Seven was well, well, maybe what. 10, 12 years from when he showed up randomly in TNA doing a very similar gimmick? I mean, so I'd say two things. Like, oh, I, oh, sorry. One, I, I, sorry, I, before you do, with Black Rain, there was also Relic, which is killer spelled backwards. <laughs> and they would all, <laughs> they'd always have to tell you that. Like yeah, three, would tell three, you. three times a match. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, one, maybe he just, he Dustin Rhodes seems to really like those bodysuits. Yeah, he does, yeah. He wore them as gold dust, he wore them as black rain. He wears them now just as the natural. Um but seven, man. I I I think that was partly down to really bad presentation because the character was not a pedophile. No. But the character was very much presented as a pedophile for some reason. Um I don't know if it was the way they filmed the uh the vignettes that introduced them of him like locking in through this kid's bedroom and you know the sort of yeah it, it mumbo was jumbo he was saying and, it was very strange and there were, but I mean as bad as that was Black Rain did more damage to him I think because that was that was one it was longer and two he was in horrendous shape and oh, three yes. every match he had was and you're gonna see it. I mean we're gonna cover that period but he. And then he had like a crow, and it was so bizarre. And everyone was like, "What are you doing?" Um, but I tell you what, one good thing, or maybe not good thing, but one thing about Black Rain that is notable is that it really serves as like um, a kind of an anchoring point for the Dustin Rhodes legacy. Like you look at him mm. now, and you go, "That is not the same guy," you know, who was Black Rain twenty years ago when he was younger and fitter and like Dustin Rhodes now looks amazing mm. and he's still capable of having good to great matches, but man, this black rain thing was depressing. But something that isn't depressing is our first one, our first real uh, woman um, showing up on this, this list or this conversation. Sue Young, the undead bride from impact wrestling. <laughs> okay. I'm going to leave this with you. Cause I, I don't have the, the 
impact background that you do. Oh so man, I'm she's... gonna leave you to tell us who Su Young is. So Su Young is uh, basically she's a, she's on un... she, look, but one of the best storytellers in the ring, right? She can do her normal anti. So basically, she's called Susie normally, right? This anti-violent character. And then when she goes in there, it's like Finn Balor, which we'll talk to in a second. And then she transforms into this undead bride and is a killer, <laughs> right? So it, it's it's very much the same kind of uh, Finn Balor and then it, the it, demon, that kind of it, thing. It sounds very impact. It is, but it's sick. Like her makeup is deadly. Like it's a proper like kabuki style. And she has like, like her whole gimmick is so unique. Uh, that WWE shouldn't have let her go, um, man. But like, look, look her up, look her up. She well, is what's success. what's she at these days? She's still an impact. Is she, like uh, as yeah. a as a wrestler? Yeah, or... she's still working. Yeah, she's married to Rich oh, uh, Swan. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So she's only a young one as well. She's like thirty three, um, but man, she's one of the one of the one of the the women that goes under the radar. Um, but absolutely do check well, her out. Speaking of women and in Daphne, particular... You're going to talk about Daphne? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know Daphne, yeah. yeah. Daphne is also someone who needs to get a, a bit of love. And she kind of uh, started that real... Um, that real... Um, she the bunny boiler gimmick? No, no, no. She no, Remember, she was... Um, she would scream a lot. She did a oh, screaming. Yeah. And she'd come out with the, the, goth, the goth makeup and that. And she... Um, in TNA, she was with uh, Abyss and Stevie yeah. Richards, but she did a lot of stuff in uh, at WCW as well. So she like there are these like uh, flashes of uh, women that are also included in the spooky gimmick, and not just like Alexa Bliss. I think that was terrible, but oh, um, Lord, <laughs> you know, still when it works, it works. But you know, it, it fails just as much there with uh with women as it does with men <laughs> but uh well, yeah w- one of the women just while we're on the subject of women wrestlers <clears throat> and particular ones who've used makeup to great effect i think abaddon is fantastic um the the makeup she uses is it's so um convincing so cre- it's it's like almost like at a, a movie prop level it's incredible uh, and again, she really commits to it. You know, she comes out crawling down to the ring. She stops halfway down to vomit blood on the <laughs> on, on the ramp. You know, she gets in the ring and she she can do the rest. And then, you know, I think her um, her finisher that sort of grounded hurricane rana she does. I think that's incredible. But also, she'll just whip their head back and bite them then as well. You know, uh, so Abaddon's one of the ones who I think is actually very good. I'd I'd like to see more of her in AEW but sure we'd like to see more of all the women in AEW absolutely like uh, and then there's um obviously the most obvious one there on the same kind of uh Sue Young Kabuki style thing is um Asuka Asuka also oh, yeah. you know very much does the same kind of thing I think Sue Young's a bit more gritty than Asuka but um yeah so- actually I'm not, uh, you know what though I'm going to say this I kind of hate Rich Swan now I didn't know they were married uh, <laughs> damn you Rich Swan. <laughs> uh, um, sorry go here's, on here's one of the ones that I find most baffling and maybe it's because he only had a very short run <clears throat> in WWE and I kind of missed it but um, I am so confused by the boogeyman yeah, I'm so confused yeah, by the popularity good. of the Boogeyman. I'm so confused by the fact that he has a Legends contract. I'm so confused can, by the, I can by the fact that he's in the Hall of Fame. I can I answer think, this. I can it, answer is this. it? So if you can answer it, is it because Vince McMahon genuinely thought he was the Boogeyman and just gave him all these accolades to to keep him placated, to stop him from crushing him? Because I can't think of any other reason why this... Uh, incredibly average gay would be he he has all the accoutrements of like an all-time legend mm, but, but his wasn't. actual in-ring period with wwe is like i know it's broken down in different periods but in, it's really only two or three years and none of it's terrific like so i can answer this Brilliant. right it didn't matter what he did in the ring didn't matter the time period 
is about 2005 to about 2009, 2008, give or take. Yeah, yeah, and then a very brief, very think, brief comeback yeah. in 2012. 12, 2012, yeah. Um, think about it, right? So he did actually win. He won a title, so he won more than Gangrel. Uh, it was the twenty. It was the twenty four seven title. Here's why he he has survived. He did his gimmick was a major part of uh, SmackDown vs Raw the series. He was always in those games for lo- like doing loads of things, right? And also that time period that we're talking about. A lot of people grew up with the boogeyman. He is a legend to a lot of to a lot of kids who are not kids anymore. Now they're probably like what between twenty two and twenty seven. They yeah. love the boogeyman because they grew up with him. That's all. That's the answer. That is the answer. But there's so the ring didn't matter. It didn't like matter. I I grew up with you know Damien Demento, but no, <laughs> nobody considers him a legend. You know, even no, the he, likes of like ones that I liked at the time. You know, Papa Shango, like Papa Shango was a ah no no, a good standing no no because of no. all the other stuff he's done. No, pa- different Papa Shango. Okay, Boogeyman is on the same level as um, the Godfather. That's where it is. You and I have have a love for the Godfather because we grew up with him. Mm. Same as the Boogeyman, but that's been compounded by the fact that you know when we were kids, the games didn't have a story mode you basically played um until like smackdown and even then it was ropey these kids would play would watch wrestling the boogeyman would show up do something weird and then they'd go in and play smackdown versus raw and no matter who you picked he would always show up as one of the characters he just has that look that gimmick that just sticks with you the whole time and it was just locked in by one growing up with him and two him showing up in these games. Now, I do fundamentally believe if he wasn't in the games as... Uh, look, again, prove me wrong. Go back and have a look at these SmackDown versus Raw games. He is in all of them. <laughs> he's in all of them, doing rakes of things. And that's why he's there. But in the ring, I mean, okay, if we were just take his in-ring work, he'd never, ever, ever get anywhere near a Hall of Fame. But that's, that's the way to cook your crumbles, man. Did did the boogeyman ever win any titles? The twenty four seven. That's it. That's all he won, yeah. Twice. <laughs> he won it once. Oh, sorry. Right. He, uh, so he, yeah. So from from there, yeah, to who I consider to be possibly the best, maybe not spooky, but certainly scary character, mm. <clears throat> is Jake the Snake Roberts. That's fair. Um, in an era when everyone was doing the ride it up, roaring at the camera, Jake the Snake Roberts was so unsettling in yeah. the way that he would walk out and he would calmly explain what he was going to do. And the thing about Jake the Snake, and it goes back to what we said earlier about how you have these supernatural characters, but they can never actually live up to the rhetoric because mm. of the limits of you know production and the limits of reality and all that. Yeah, Jake the Snake, on the other hand, would come out and make a really unsettling threat and then do it. And I think to this day, never mind the flips, the exploding rings, the getting thrown off cages, to this day, one of the top five scariest moments in all of wrestling is Jake the Snake unleashing that snake on the macho man and it actually biting him. Go back and watch that now and that's still disturbing. But see, that's the difference. I mean, like going for the, the the serial killer. I think his character was based on um, what's the movie called? Point Break, not Point Break. Oh, I can't remember the name. Simpsons did a part did a parody of it. I don't know. It's the one with the Nero in it. Oh, I can't remember the name. It's gone. But no, do you know where they go to uh, Pleasant Lake or Terror? Oh, Lake? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the movie with De Niro, and he's yeah. They basically do a whole thing of it. That's what that movie was based. That what that character was based on, um, and it's pretty much the same kind of thing. Oh, that's and it bugging was, me now. I, I can actually see the yeah I, the I, VHS I, cover I, of it. I cannot remember the name of it. It's not Terror Lake. It's it's something. Uh, people yeah. are screaming at at that at their podcast <laughs> now. Going, it's this one. It's this one. Um, <laughs> Lake Placid. Lake. <laughs> But yeah, and I mean the thing of it is like so that aside, but wrestling has you know they either go one or two ways where they go the supernatural thing or they use the other side of horror, this this the slasher. 
And the slasher really hasn't been used that much in wrestling like you would think it would be because it's, you know, it's kind of a harder sell. A like Kane did it where he actually ended up becoming a slasher villain when he did that movie, uh, See No Evil. Leatherface yeah. was in New Japan. Freddy Krueger was in WCW briefly. Uh, like the Freddy Krueger. The problem with the problem with these guys, the problem with having the slasher or the chainsaw or all that is at some stage you gotta stab someone or mm. else the slasher gimmick is is good. It's like Drew McIntyre carrying around the sword that he never swings at anyone, you know. Yeah, no, and it's you know, it, it it is what it is. Um but um hold on, what's going on there? Audio's a bit weird. Is your audio oh. gone as well? Mm. No, no, no. Mine's fine. Mine's okay. fine. Um, there's something on the line there. Sorry about that. Right. Um, so the next one that we're going for is Willow. Willow was not a good character. Willow was terrible. So I, I, so I again, this is another one I'm really interested to learn about because I've heard okay. Jeff Hardy talking multiple times about Willow. Uh, he wants to bring back Willow about how Willow gave him like loads of <clears throat> like creative uh ideas and different creative avenues you could go down like you you saw the whole run i assume like what's your take on willow it was terrible <laughs> <laughs> on to the next one <laughs> on the next one so so this was um his character from when he was in omega which was the which was the company not company it was like an indie that him my hardy and uh a few of the lads like shannon moore and a few of the other lads were in and uh, he showed up uh, during Little Lockdown with MVP, and basically he was a he was a witch, kind of had black and white face paint, and then showed up with an umbrella. All right, re- re- ready to keep the black rain off. Yeah, and it was only like it was in 2013, so it was a couple of months. And by 2014, you know, Jeff was back. Uh, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, if there had been some kind of direction towards it, it would have made some kind of sense. And Jeff Hardy actually ended up, um, he ended up killing off the character because he got attacked. No, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. He ended up attacking, he, he got attacked by many willows and ended up defeating <laughs> all of them. How did, how did they film that? The willow is a costume as well. So they just had loads of people in willow costumes attacking them backstage oh. and that's how jeff hardy kind of got rid of the willow character um it's it's terrible um <laughs> i mean I, I he has talked about bringing it back and i genuinely hope that they're like no jeff we're, we're not letting you do that but one credit i do have to give to, to, to tna abyss yes so the mnemonic son of farther james mitchell so 2002 he showed up yeah, he was a discount Kmart Kane or um, Mr. Price Kane or whatever you want to call him, whatever. It was kind of a half Kane, half, half man kind. Kane. And that's what I thought too. And that was why I kind of got into the character. You know, people would run him down in that way. And I was like, no, he was more man because he would do, he would have the size of Kane, right? And yeah. he'd choke slam, do all that kind of stuff. But then I, I bet, he, I bet you could take a matches. pedigree without dropping to his knees. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, the black hole slam is still one of the best finishers ever as well. Cause that thing looked like a hurt. looks well, like a hurt. One thing that I always, so <clears throat> again, I d- don't have the sort of impact TNA background you do, but I would see you best and I'd be like, yeah, he's kind of, kind of a rip off mankind. Um, and then I watched some of his matches on YouTube. God, I got a whole new respect for him. Like if, if he was, I'm not saying he was, but if he was a rip off mankind, he, fully committed to that like he killed himself in these matches he really went all out in them and I, I kind of and not even from following his whole arc just from you know uh, viewing different matches on YouTube kind of gained a whole new respect for him he, he's one um, I'd like to know like w- what is he up to today is he done now is he no he's working he's working in WWE as an agent oh right oh, yeah, that's he, brilliant he signed the same time as AJ Stoltz Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, yeah, yeah. He oh, was really, <laughs> kind of really happy to hear that. Yeah, that's where he is now. So, um, I mean, yeah, he, he's one of those guys who, um, even if you weren't a fan, even if you didn't follow him, he's just really happy to hear that he's earning a good living from wrestling now without having to. Oh man, know, 
and he, himself. Like it's a, look, it we're we are going to talk about TNA at certain points for good and bad. And some of the best things that were in, in were in TNA were Abyss. Genuinely, I'm a huge fan of Abyss. I got to see him wrestle many times when I was in the Impact Zone. Got to see him in Dublin. Got to see him in in Manchester, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he is great. It's a shame though that nobody saw these matches on a wider scale. Nobody got exposed to Abyss because he was mainly in Impact, and that was it. He wasn't in WWE. He wasn't in WCW. He wasn't in ECW. Come he, here. Or, was he like? Like just a real hardcore impact loyalist, or was there just was there never I don't any know. interest from but anywhere no, else? Well there was. There was. I, I you know, around two thousand and eight and two thousand nine there was interest, but you know, he could probably you know, even AJ AJ didn't leave until the the this ship was really sinking in TNA. Uh and I just think he was just happy enough, you know, and then he did get the offer for WDB and then eventually would move before they became impact wrestling. Um, but we are going to talk about, you know, his feel like he had an ama- one of the best cage matches you'll ever see with with, with Sabu. Um, and Sabu's a broken arm, and they're going in there and killing each other. It's fantastic. Uh, really good matches with Christian Cage. Fantastic run with Christian Cage, actually. With Sting, brilliant feud with Sting, barring one match, which we'll talk about. Um, <laughs> an incredible match with Kurt Angle. I don't know why they brought up Judas Mercedes in this one, because that was, that was the second... Um, Barb wire match, which wasn't a good one. Uh, the one with Sabu was fantastic. So, I mean, look, there's loads to talk about. This will not be the last time we'll be talking about Abyss. We're going to probably do a whole thing on Abyss. Um, but he's one of the best characters that, stray from a horror movie, just brilliant. Just brilliant. Uh, well, from the from the, the real serious kind of a hardcore side of Sabus, of Abyss, we're going to veer widely, wildly now to a wrestler who I did not want to see in AEW. I did not think he would work. Oh, no. And I'm very happy to say I yeah. have been proven wrong. Yeah. I love Danhausen. Uh, how can you not? <laughs> I, th- I think they've gotten that character perfectly right in that he's not supernatural. He's not spooky. He can't do curses. He just thinks he can, and that is uh, as long, as long as you don't overexpose that. You know, as long as he he never gets a run with the world title or whatever. I'm fully on the Danhausen train. I I love him. He's a brilliant. He's just brilliant. He it, it's one of those characters where you're like, I don't like this, but I do. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know what? I kind of really uh, even. So I love the character. I love all the stuff he do. He does. I think he's so good. His timing is incredible at sort of creepy <laughs> vaudeville comedy. But I love him even more because of his backstory. Because he was just another high work rate, you know, uh, wearing kick pads, you know, flipping around the place, uh, cruiserweight guy. And he was doing all these shows, touring the world, touring the country, killing himself in these matches, getting nowhere because at that time period, all these kind of Jeff Hardy inspired guys were 10 a penny. And he completely more or less given up on wrestling. And then he thought, I'm going to give it one last shot. But this, you know, sincere kick pads, uh, work rate guy thing isn't working for me. I'm just going to go and have fun. I'm going to be as weird as he, he likes, like old school horror movies and stuff. I'm going to be as weird as I possibly can. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'm just going to go and enjoy myself. And it completely took off. But that's it. I mean, that's the thing. Like with wrestling, again, it's not a sport. It doesn't matter how good you are, that's going to hit a barrier eventually. I mean, look at Ronda Rousey. Look at Brock Lesnar. They had to actually change up their approach or even Kurt Angle the man won a Kurt Angle, uh, worth a, won a gold medal with a broken freaking neck and yep. people liked that he was goofy and that he went to you know the, the milk bash and stuff you have to you know as you said turn your personality up to 11 or else give yourself a character that people can invest in because again you just and I, I hate to keep going back to it but I, I've been playing in a band since I was 13 I'm playing music 20, 21 years, right? And if I go see a bunch of lads play and they're in jeans and a t-shirt, doesn't matter how good they are, I'm like, okay, I've, I've seen this before. But if I go and see a show, I'm like, okay, we're going to, we're going to, 
actually watch this, you know? And it's the same with anything. It's the same with any kind of entertainment. It, it needs to have a hook. There needs to be some kind of thing grabbing people going, this is what you're going to do. And, you know, wrestling has this easy way to do it. And Dan Housen figured it out. Undertaker is the greatest, and we're short for time. I'm going to just, you know, go, and close it here. Undertaker is the greatest example of this in the in wrestling. He is, yeah, oh you know, yeah, un- un- he, undoubtedly. He's one of the greatest characters ever. But and you saw the ebb and flow where he was able to go from a mortician to you know being the dead man to going to having the satanic, the real satanic edge, which actually got the WWE in trouble because they're like you're crucifying people on television and doing satanic <laughs> rituals, which you, he was <laughs> like I mean, and then you know was able to do the biker thing and then go back to the dead man and just. Having this whole character, which is very much something, I mean, like, Mark Calloway bounced between gimmicks, you know? Yeah, but he always stayed within the realm of The Undertaker. Like, he no, never, but, no, he never showed up elsewhere as, oh, no, yeah, beforehand. beforehand. Like, and it's Mark very, Calloway. And yeah, it's the, very same, it's the very same thing as you said with, said with uh, Danhausen, where it's like, you know, great work rate guy, phenomenal wrestler, but never was able to click. Kane the same way, you know, showed up as... Uh, Jerry Lawler's, Lawler's um, dentist. <laughs> Isaac know? Yankum. Isaac Yankum. And it wasn't until he, and you know, fake Diesel, it wasn't until he found this niche in this supernatural soup of the WWE's Undertaker um, extend, extended universe where they're able to bring in these. And you know what, I'll be honest with you, I don't think they, they utilized it as much as they could have. They could have brought in a few more characters to be able to flesh that out, but it was just, it was what it was. I think there was scope for more characters in this world but you know maybe two three if you include paul bearer paul bearer paul bearer um was the right way to go but undertaker you know think about his legacy man the inferno match casket match buried alive match hell in the cell match these all exist because of the undertaker yeah but well because you needed to suit a larger than life gimmick you needed a larger than life match you could yeah. as you say you couldn't have a real you know 15 minute five star banger well he could he did Shawn michaels yeah but again he did later in life when the gimmick wasn't so much uh character base or it wasn't so much well, it didn't no. veer so heavily into the like as you, like the mortician element of it or the well look you, you, the guy you, out the back planing the coffins actually i think that's my favorite undertaker yeah, no, that was, you know, I, but the thing is, I mean, if you're, you can have your cake and eat it, eat it too, if you do it the right way. And, you know, I hope, you know, that's come across during this, during this conversation, because like, we've seen it been done badly. And WCW is like, there, there is a book about it. It's called The, the, the Rise and Fall of WCW by uh, Brian Alvarez and you can kind of read it and, and see these horrible gimmicks that were just you know oh my god the whole like and we, we, don't have time, we don't have time to go into them but yeah the whole Dungeon of Doom was ridiculous I would love to spend like a whole show on its own just ripping the piss out of Kevin Nash over the Oz gimmick Like, well here's the thing Martin what we're going to do is as we go back back in time we will be experienced these in context because context matters and I think that's one thing that they own lists that you see on like Bleach Report or what culture, no matter how good those lists are, you can't really get the context of these gimmicks. And that's what we try to do here, try to give you guys context of these gimmicks, good and bad. And it, it's funny that, like, we started off with Bray Wyatt and we finished with the man who got this most, other than Bray Wyatt. I do genuinely think Bray Wyatt's going to be the new Undertaker. In, in I mean, in legacy. But, leg, but there's only been one man who's really did this properly, and that's the Undertaker. Yeah. Like, without him, supernatural red like but, yeah, at one point he had lightning powers but, but it's because even when the undertaker lost they never pulled the rug out from underneath them no they constantly kept setting bray wyatt up for failure they would set up this you know this amazing cult leader or this like supernatural you know clown character and then they would have him squashed by goldberg or have him you know beaten in a hell in the cell match with a stupid red light or yeah like, even when The Undertaker was beaten or lost, they never pulled the rug out from underneath them. Yeah. And I, again, like I say, I'm not the biggest fan of WWE these days, but I, I do hope that they will, 
<laughs> give this fella a chance because he's, he's not going to make it anywhere else. He doesn't fit in in AEW. Impact can't afford him. Yeah, you know, New Japan would look at him, you know, out of breath, running the ropes, and send him back to. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, New Japan they could do it, but he would have to improve more than I think his buddy's probably able to do, which is fine. It's. He he's able to do what he's able to do, and what, he's, he, what he does, he does very well. WWE just need to keep, just need to kind of give him the ball and let him do it. Like look at Finn Balor. Finn Balor, the same thing now. There's kind of been a bit of a renaissance with Finn Balor doing very much a similar gimmick where he was kind of lost in the shuffle with WWE, and now he's back. And I wouldn't mind the demon gimmick is so cool that when he brings that back, that's a whole other thing. With wrestling, it's the only sport, and again, I use that term very loosely folks um where you can where the character matters more than the in-ring stuff for the most part yeah and, well you know. i think it's like anything else i think you need a you need a good mix um, you do need a good mix yeah you and there are there are terrible characters who no there are guys who can't wrestle who get over because of great characters and there are guys who were great wrestlers but maybe not great characters but get over because of that yeah. so there are um there are examples at the extremes you know like Maybe your uh, Brian Danielsons and your Bret Harts and stuff like that were never huge character guys, um, but at the same time, yeah, I think ideally what you want is like a really great mix. Yeah, too. absolutely. So again, folks, want to wish you all a happy Halloween, a happy Eoselma. Um, again, if you guys want some spoopy music, go over check Horenda out because we do drop stuff around Halloween. Um, and Martin, is there anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Yeah, I mean, ugh, I could have talked about all this this all day. Like, we never even got into, like, how good an evil doink would have been if they'd let that run, or we never got yes. to take the piss out of a rackna man or anything. <laughs> but um, what I will say is, so it's Halloween, everyone's out, you got your spooky films, you got your trick-or-treating if you've kids, you've got, <clears throat> you know, out dressed up and doing all that crack. If you fancy a night in playing games for Halloween, the creepiest, scary game I've ever played, and I'm delighted to see it's getting a remake, is Dead Space. Yes. Um, and I actually, from when I originally played it back in like 2015, I actually got one of the, uh, your Facebook sends you updates. Yes. Like, oh, this is what you to- this is what you posted seven years ago. Mm. And I got one from when I'd first bought Dead Space. <clears throat> and it says something along the lines of, I find that if I limit myself to playing once a week for about an hour, my heart can just about handle the stress of playing. <laughs> so there you go. That's my recommendation for this week. Either get the get the remake or get yourself an old Xbox 360 and give Dead Space a go. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Well, folks, we'll be back next week. We don't know what we're going to talk about. Go over to the wrestlingrewind.com where you'll find all our social medias. We will be updating and we're going to get better at that. But again, thank you so much for checking us out. Go over to the Two Penny channel, nerdtoknowmedia.com. And of course, here on Phoenix, it it was 2.5. Talk to you again. Bye. It got on in a flash. They did the match. They did the monster match. The zombies were having fun. You have nothing else to do on a Saturday? Do you like nerd things? Now check out Nerd to Know Basis here on Phoenix 92.5 FM, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then head over to nerdtoknowmedia.com for all of our shows as part of the Nerd to Know Media Radio Network. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production. 